Hello, hello, and thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Women of Color and Confidence. I am your host, Amber Rose West. Thank you so much for joining me. For those of you who have been with me for a few years, you know that I talk about self-confidence as a two-part process. If you're new to hanging out with me, hello and welcome. Today, I'm going to share with you a bit of that two-part process, and I'm going to share with you a part of building self-confidence that other confidence coaches really drop the ball on sharing. So other confidence coaches will tell you that the second part of building self-confidence is a big part or the most important part of building your confidence, and that's the outward expression. You know, what you look like, what you sound like, everything that's here on the outside. They try to jump over the core work so that you can get the results that you desperately want, which is showing up and being a more confident person. The problem here is that there are plenty of tips and tricks that coaches can teach you that help you experience self-confidence on a very temporary level. And sometimes those things work when you need self-confidence on a very temporary level, but that's only short term. That self-confidence that you'll get from those tips and tricks is short term, temporary, and then you get right back into feeling like you're not the confident person that you wanna be. Around here, we're all about developing sustainable self-confidence. And in order to do that, there's a very pivotal step that must come before any of the work that you do on outward expression of self-confidence, and that's the internal creation. The two-part process that I teach is you have self-confidence as an internal creation and then an outward expression. This is why I focus so much on self-talk. Well, that and the fact that communication is a huge part of why I teach, what I teach, and what I'm passionate about. But self-talk is the zenith of everything that comes out of your mouth. How you talk to yourself and how you talk to the world around you, it all stems from your self-talk. So you may try to fake your way using fancy words or curated speechy speechies. <laughs> So you may try to fake your way with fancy words or curated speeches, but if your self-talk is telling you to fear how other people are gonna judge you, or to fear failure, that your failure is imminent, or that no one cares about what it is that you're trying to say, then everything that you actually say that comes out of your mouth is shaded with all of that negativity that's swirling around in your self-talk. You can put glitter on a poop, at the end of the day, it's still poop. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know why that analogy came to me, but that's the one that came, so we're going to roll with it. <laughs> Part of the reason that your speaking voice isn't as confident as you want it to be is because your head is full of insecurities. Insecurities about people judging you or that you'll experience failure or that you don't belong wherever it is that you want to be tossed in there with some co comparison, imposter syndrome, and this overwhelming inner critic, your head is full of negativity, criticism, and complaining. It's a much thicker environment to weed through in order to get to the self-confidence that you're looking for. I want to help you overpower these insecurities because sustainable self-confidence requires that you do that. So I'm going to ask you, how long have you been trying to reach self-confidence that looks and feels authentic to you? That self-confidence that isn't wavering under the loudest voice in the room, that isn't shaken by criticism or judgment. You've very likely read some books, and even after you've read those books, they leave you feeling incomplete because you're not exactly sure how to implement what it is that you're reading and learning from this book into your life specifically. You've likely watched some videos on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, and they leave you feeling like you have questions that are unanswered. You may attend events that will leave you feeling pumped, right? Have you ever been to an event and you're like, oh, I'm so pumped, I can't wait to start implementing all of these things I've learned. But then you get home and you're like, I'm not exactly sure how to implement all those things that I've learned. And then you slump right back into the insecurities after you're home, away from all the people, away from these motivational, confident speakers that you were just around. I 100% understand all of those feelings and those experiences. That's exactly where I was too. And all of the reasons that I created my confidence courses and my confidence programs and this confident coaching life that I live right now. 
I don't want you to feel like you have questions that are unanswered or you don't understand how to implement these different things into your life specifically. I don't want you feeling incomplete or in this temporary state of, I have self-confidence, now I don't. I have self-confidence, now I don't, right? I was in that place and I decided to do my research. I studied what actually helps women build self-confidence for the long haul, that sustainable self-confidence. And that's what I'm gonna start sharing with you today. Not that I'm gonna start sharing it because you know that that's all that I talk about. (laughs) But I'm gonna talk about where you can start that journey. The first step here is amazingly transformational. And yes, I said transformational because it actually can transform who you are as a person and who you want to be and infuse that with self-confidence. So don't get stuck by the buzzword, but just know that a lot of this stuff does transform you and and help you turn into the woman that it is that you're wanting to be, which is someone with more self-confidence, more self-respect, more self-validation, more self-acceptance, more of all of that, which is very likely in a place that you're wanting to be compared to where you are right now. The first step is understanding your insecurities, learning how to overpower them, looking them dead in the eye and letting them know that you are the boss around here and there's gonna be some changes made around here. (laughs) I do actually look at my inner critic sometimes and be like, I'm the boss, I am the boss, you are not the boss. You can do the same thing with your insecurities and it actually works. So there's that. (laughs) I just released a new confidence building guide called Overpower Your Insecurities. I will put a link to that audio guide in the show notes of this episode. But today I wanted to talk about a couple of the points inside the guide, why they're important and how using this as the first stepping stone into your confidence work is the best place to start if what you're looking for is self-confidence that stays with you for years and years to come, no matter what is involved in your life, in your community, in your people, in your business, in your projects, or in your collaborations. So why is this the best place to start? Well, first and foremost, you cannot build self-confidence in the same place that your insecurities are running rampant. You just can't, okay? So it's it's the same as that quote, like you can't heal in the same environment where you were hurt, okay? Like if you want more self-confidence, you have to make space for it. And right now your insecurities, all of them are just like running amok inside your brain, inside your heart. They're making you believe things about yourself that you don't wanna be true. They're making you feel a certain way about you that you don't wanna be true. And you can't build self-confidence in that same place. So first we have to look at those insecurities, learn why they're there, and then start managing their presence in your life. Second, If the ultimate goal is self-love, self-confidence, self-respect, and self-acceptance, first we need to figure out why those things don't feel comfortable thriving in your mental and emotional environment. And usually it's because those other things have taken up way too much space and we've had them for a long time. And so not only are they taking up space, but they've also taken up root, right? So we have to pull them up by their root. We have to handle the soil that's in there. We have to plant the seeds of what we want, which is self-love, self-confidence, self-respect, right? And allow those things to grow without the other thing weeding up our new blossoms. And the third here is that gaining more self-confidence doesn't automatically mean that you completely diminish your insecurities. Insecurities very rarely, if ever, get to level zero. There's always going to be some level of insecurity within you. That's not a bad thing, right? And that's not really the goal either. Our goal isn't to be like, I have no insecurities. We just want to make sure that you're not spending so much time trying to make it so that your insecurities don't exist, right? We don't want you focusing that. We don't want you spending a lot of time there trying to get your insecurities down to level zero. You want to thoroughly understand the insecurities you have to manage in order to develop more self-confidence. Yes, managing the insecurities is essential. Why? Because you're going to experience them. It's a part of human nature. Doubt, Fear, believing other people are better than you, feeling like you may not be the best person for whatever task you have ahead of you, uncertainty, wanting more. It's all about the human experience. 
The problem with our insecurities is that they have too much control over our lives. They have too much control over our thoughts, our actions. They're dominated by insecurities instead of by confidence, right? So also think in your brain, do you have insecurities and confidence right now? Probably. You probably have confidence with some things, but not everything. And you probably have insecurities with some things and not everything, right? There are some things where you're like, I am definitely the woman for that job. I definitely can do that. I am the best person to do that, right? That's confidence. But right now what's happening is you have all of this, all of this up turned way too up. The insecurities turned way too up and your confidence is like, meow, meow, meow. so what we want to do is like bring it back the other way around, okay? The goal is to make your self-confidence more powerful. Just the mere presence of more powerful self-confidence will allow those insecurities to minimize themselves and become more manageable. So you don't have to focus on less insecurities. You just have to focus on more confidence. Fun little statistic for you. 85% of the world's population are affected by low self-esteem. Self-esteem is often referred to as self-worth or self-respect. When individuals have low self-esteem, it can be difficult for some individuals to feel a sense of worth or confidence in who they are. That's a statistic that came from Better Health, which came from a psychology study. But think about that, 85%. That's massive. That's a lot of people. I want you to be part of the 15%, by the way. <laughs> that is my goal. That is my purpose on this earth to get that 15% up and that 85% down. So real quick, let me tell you the difference between self-esteem, self-respect, and self-confidence. Self-confidence is important for ambitious women such as yourself because it speaks directly to how well you believe you can achieve your outcomes. And your outcomes can be your goals, your dreams, and ultimately your success. You can't build self-confidence without self-esteem and self-respect. Self-esteem and self-respect is how you think about who you are, right? The person that you are, me as Amber Rose West, and how I feel about Amber Rose West is my self-esteem. How well I believe I can run this podcast, how well I believe I can serve my clients as a confidence coach, how well I believe I can establish myself as an authority in my industry and grow my business, all of that is fueled by my self-confidence. So self-esteem is how I feel about me as a person and my self-confidence is how I feel about me being the person doing the things that fulfill my dreams. Self-respect is a point in the audio guide that I'm going to talk about here, and we're going to touch on that a little bit in a minute. And part of the reason that I share that stat is because, one, I want you to understand, and I hope that it helps you understand, that you're not alone in the way that you're feeling about your self-esteem or your self-confidence, okay? 85% of the world feels similarly to you. And number two... There is a chunk of people who identify as feeling worthy and full of self-respect. They have confidence in who they are and what it is that they can accomplish. And I want you to be a part of that group. That 15% exists, which means that you know that you can also be a part of that 15%. How do you think that those other people got out of what has now become so normal, right? 85% means that it's common. It's a common thing that people feel unworthy and that they lack self-esteem or self-respect. Why are people still in that 85% and how did the 15% break out of it? The ones that broke out of it made the decision that they wanted to get out of it. They made the decision to learn the ways to reprogram their self-confidence. Those first steps of reprogramming your self-confidence comes from overpowering the insecurities that are taking up way too much space in your head and in your heart. So let's talk about the audio guide. Overpower your insecurities. 
Now that you know how it got its title, let's talk about what's inside. There are 14 points. Originally, it was going to be a 14 day challenge, but I understand that all of us are busy. It gets hard to focus on something for 14 days. And instead, I just decided to make it a 14 point guide so that you can follow along with it as your schedule and attention allows you. OK, I'm not going to go through all 14 points today. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about what's inside so that before you download it, before you start listening, you know what it is that you're getting yourself into. So the guide is separated into three sections ish. There's no like separation, but I wrote it in three different sections with three different intentions. The first intention is just acknowledging who you are as a person, because we all again, have these commonalities within us or within the environments we find ourselves in. And us as people, we got to deal with this stuff on a regular basis. And so I put a section in there that's all of us, everything that we have to deal with. And the very first bits of insecurities and and these first bits of insecurities are what feed the main insecurities that you have. I'll go over them in just a section, but that's the first second section. That is the first section. (laughs) The second one focuses specifically on insecurities that hit ambitious people, because those are the people that I work with and those are the people that I want to help. If you are someone who has a dream, a passion, a purpose, a a message, something that you're attempting to accomplish, whether or not that's starting a business, writing a book, being a public speaker, uh, you have projects that you want to collaborate with other people on all of that is you taking something that you know or you want to share and giving it to other people to positively impact their lives and ambitious people are the type of people that follow that energy follow that spark inside of them right And because it takes so much energy and time, attention and love to be an ambitious person and follow a dream, we have very specific insecurities that hit us that don't necessarily hit other people that are not as ambitious as us. So that second section will handle those specific insecurities. And then the third section is the goodness that can be created by overpowering your insecurities. Because you know I had to leave you on a high note. I wasn't going to be like, poke, 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 poke at all your insecurities and then (laughs) leave you like, okay, cool, Amber, thanks for that. (laughs) No, the last little section is some goodness. I made sure to end it on some goodness. Um, Because I want you to know that even though you're doing the work to understand how it is you can overpower your insecurities, there's still goodness in this journey. It's not all negative. It's not all insecurities. There is some good stuff that can come out of overpowering those insecurities. So let's talk about section one, acknowledging who you are as a person. All things that are very normal to our human experience. Inside we have neutralizing negativity, minimizing the amount of complaining that you do or the amount of complaining that you have around you, the state of your self-talk and how you can turn it into something that's more positive, and tapping into your inner knowing. Your inner knowing is the part from this section that we're going to talk about today. You can think about this as listening to yourself or trusting your intuition, but I'm going to break it down just a little bit more for you. Much of our mental and emotional landscape we that we have as adults was developed when we were a child. So when you're a kid, you constantly have people talking to you and telling you what to do. They tell you how to dress. They tell you when to eat and what to eat. They tell you when to go to bed and when to wake up. Um, they tell you where you need to go every day and what you need to be doing wherever it is that you go every day. Um, They tell you where you're not allowed to go and the things that you're not supposed to be doing. They tell you who you can and cannot talk to, um, the activities that you're going to do. I mean, it's never ending, right? You just have adults, teachers, coaches all over the place telling you constantly what it is to do, what it is that you're supposed to be, who it is that you're supposed to be, what it is that you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to be there, all of that stuff. There's this constant input and direction of who you're supposed to be as a person, right? When you're an adult, you don't have that anymore. All you have is the remnants of voices from your childhood development. And see, these voices can turn into inner critics. And those voices can start 
making you feel bad about the person that you want to be when you don't have someone telling you who you're supposed to be, right? So what is the inner knowing? It's that feeling in your heart that sparks a want or a need or a desire. It's the one that says, I have an interest in this and I'm going to learn more or I want to explore that. I want to build this thing. I want more of this in my life. It's that message that comes to you in the form of a feeling that we then put words to, that we then take action with. Your inner knowing is attempting to guide you towards all of that. So in the same way that our parents and teachers and coaches used to tell us when we were kids where to go, what to do, because they believed that what they were telling us was going to develop us into healthy, happy adults, right? Your inner knowing is attempting to do the same thing, except it's generated from inside of you. But your insecurities get in the way when you're an adult not having someone else tell you these things. Part of this section is about acknowledging the normalcy of being in the world that we live in right now. So the world that we live in right now is full of negativity and complaining. It's less about loving self-talk, right? And going back to what it is that you are trying to tell yourself, your inner knowing is trying to get you into a place of positivity, into less complaining and more focusing on things that will bring you joy and happiness and more loving self-talk. Your inner knowing fuels everything and yet you're ignoring it, you're stifling it. Tapping into that inner knowing and trusting that it's trying to guide you towards more happiness and more fulfillment is point number one inside of the Overpower Your Insecurities audio guide because it's the fuel. It's the fire, baby. It's the northern star. It's your inner compass. And if anything has been tap, 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 tapping on your heart, you know that, yes, you can ignore it. But does it ever go away? You want to be a more confident person. Tap, tap, tap. I want to be a more confident person. Tap, tap, tap. And you ignore it. Because you believe that you can't do it, or it's going to be too hard, or it's going to be too much work to change. You ignore it, but does it go away? Probably not. (laughs) That's why you're here right now. And this inner knowing piece is one of the most important pieces, which is why it's a numero uno inside of this audio guide. Okay, so the second section Here's where we focus on the insecurities that hit ambitious people. Inside of this section, I cover fear of judgment, which is a big biggie, a big biggie. (laughs) It's a big biggie for many people. And I want to tell you why. I've been in the online industry for too many years. (laughs) It's been a lot of years. Before I was in the online industry, I was in in in-person, right? I had an art gallery. I did in-person groups and sessions. I talked to people one-on-one in my research studies in college. Always, always, when I would ask them, what's stopping you? Why can't you do this? Why do you believe that you can't do this? Always on the list, top of the list, top three for sure was fear of judgment. I fear what people will say. I don't I don't want to know what they're going to say. I don't want people to criticize me. I don't want haters. I don't want them to think I'm dumb or that I'm stupid or, you know, I just they don't they don't want to hear it. And they fear that that's what people are going to do. And now that all of us are online and on social media, that fear has been brought to life in a very real way. Haters, trolls, people that only comment on your stuff to disagree with you, right? It's so annoying. All of that feeds this fear of judgment that we have in following our inner knowing. And most people have that fear. Now, I also want to say real quick before I move on, all of us have that fear because a lot of us spend our time judging. And when you look at research from people who are near passing on or they're on their deathbed, one of the top five things that constantly comes up from people that are getting ready to leave this earth is 
I wish I would have cared less about what other people thought and I would have followed my heart. And that's really huge. So much of us spend our living years fearful of what other people will think of us so much that we don't follow our dreams. I'm choking up right now. Why am I crying right now? (laughs) (laughs) So many spend so much time fearing what other people will think about us following our dreams and we waste all of those years and then we get to the end and we wish that we would not have done that. And the reason I I brought this up on an episode before, and the reason I keep bringing it up is because I don't want you to waste any more of your life fearing something that you're going to wish you didn't fear when all of this time is over. (laughs) Because whatever it is that is tap, tap, tapping on you right now found you for a reason is part of your journey for a reason and you can continue ignoring it but why you can continue pretending that it wasn't meant for you or you're not the person but why when you could say okay i have fear of judgment here and instead of letting that fear of judgment stop me I'm going to figure out why it is that I have this fear of judgment, work through that fear of judgment and answer the tapping that's on my soul right now. So anyway, that's my brief. I can't. (laughs) I got so emotional because it's so real. (laughs) Okay, so in this section, just to bring it back a little bit, because I went on a bit of a tangent because I think that tangent's really important. It's not the first time you've heard it and it'll probably not be the last time you've heard it. (laughs) But the second section is focusing on insecurities that hit ambitious people. Top of the list is fear of judgment. We also have comparison, perfectionism, and imposter syndrome. You can find most of those pretty high on the list of confidence crushers for ambitious people. And the one that I want to talk about with you today that is the fifth one inside of this section is the one that a lot of confidence coaches don't talk about. And I think it's probably because they don't know enough about it to share it with you, but I do. I've researched this at length. It's one of my favorites. If I begin to nerd out, you will understand why once I get to the end. But the fifth point inside of this section is all about the inner critics specifically the seven different inner critic archetypes. So we're going to talk about what the archetypes are, and then we're going to talk about how they came to be and how you can engage them so that you can overpower them. Meet the inner critics. That's point number seven inside of the Overpower Your Insecurities audio guide. And I understand that one of the best tools that people use to um, handle their inner critics before they learn about the archetypes is by naming the inner critic so that you can address it or tell it no thank you or tell it to go away or like, hey, I appreciate where you are right now, but like, can you beat it, scoot please, right? That's a very common way to manage an inner critic. The more specific tool that people don't know and don't use is understanding the seven different archetypes that can all be rolled into the one personification of the inner critic inside of your head. So I'm going to go through the seven inner critics real quick here and how it is that they are developed inside of some people um, and how they can impact you as an adult. So the first thing we have here is the perfectionist inner critic. The perfectionist inner critic is probably one that you will resonate with most because we talk a lot about perfectionism um, in the um, circles of ambitious people. (laughs) Perfectionism often comes up because when we put our heart and time and attention and passion into a project, we want it to be perfect. We have this this visualization about what it's going to be and how it's going to help people, right? And so our perfectionist comes in, sets these extremely high standards on our work, and then makes us feel like crap and we don't meet those standards. The perfectionist inner critic, um, again, inner critics are very much developed in childhood um, from the people that we have around us. So if you were a kid that was precocious, if you were a kid that would like excelled at things very easily when you were a kid, 
Uh, and the people that you had around you, your parents, your teachers, your coaches, your community members were always like, you know, she's the best at it or she's got this no problem. But then as you got older, you stopped being so easily able to do things. Um, and people were like, what's wrong with you? You're normally so, so great at it. You normally pick things up really quickly. The inner critic, uh, the perfectionist inner critic usually develops around that space when you feel like, People used to tell me I was great at everything and picked up everything so easily. And now that I'm adult, I it's not coming as easily to me. And why is that, right? Your perfectionist inner critic comes in, pokes the holes inside of your standards and uh, really makes you feel like you're not living up to them. The second one is the inner controller. So the inner controller is, this one works in a very cyclical way, which is that it really... Like if you're someone that deals with yourself through your vices, whether that's overeating, over drinking, over spending, over shopping, whatever it is, right? Um, if you have an addictive personality to things like food, money, um, alcohol, shopping, like materialistic things, social media is now a new great addiction that the kids are getting into for great. Um, the inner controller, when you're not feeling good about yourself, you turn to your vices and then you overdo it with your vices. And then your inner controller comes in and is like, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't you feel bad now that you, oh, you ate that whole pizza? Or don't you feel bad that you just spent a thousand dollars on Amazon? Or don't you feel bad? And then you do feel bad. And what do you do? you turn to your vices <laughs> because for a minute your vices make you feel good but then your inner controller comes in and says don't you feel bad and then you're like yeah i do so then you turn to your vice and it's this whole cyclical um nature of behavior so understanding how your uh, inner controller inner critic impacts you can actually help you separate from overdoing it with your vices not stopping them completely but knowing how it is that you use them as a way to to self-soothe and things like that Okay, so the third one here is the underminer. The underminer inner critic just likes to come in and poke holes in your self-confidence. Um, I know that there's a lot of like mean girl and bullying that goes on with my underminer. Who do you think you are? Why do you think that you're the person that can do that? Uh, other people are already doing that better than you. So like, why do you even feel like you you you, you should be doing, you can be doing it? Um, you definitely aren't the person to make that kind of money. You're not the kind of person that people want to work with. Um, you're kind of ugly. You're kind of funny looking your cock eyes sometimes the gap in your tooth makes you look weird nobody likes people with curly hair just poking holes at the confidence that i have about my appearance who i am what i do the underminer will come in and just start poke poke poking at all of those um, pieces of the self-confidence that you are attempting to build the fourth one here is the taskmaster now when I say that the perfectionist comes in and gets us ambitious people, the task master is right behind. Okay, the task master likes to come in and make you believe that if you are not 100% focused and dedicated on the work that needs to be done constantly, that you will never reach the level of success that you are attempting to achieve. Ain't that a stinker, right? And those of us who are ambitious people already have this kind of mentality within us because our dreams and our success are constantly tap, tap, tapping on our heart, constantly tap, tap, tapping on our heads. And so we're like, gotta work, gotta work, gotta work, right? But the one thing that we've learned about that in the last couple of years is it always leads to burnout. It always leads to us feeling like the dream is not worth the work. If we're constantly go, 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 work, 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 then we're like, I don't have anything else to give. I don't have any more steam to go, right? And so now we're learning about the importance of rest and self-care, giving ourselves permission to slow down and be restful, right? But then here comes the taskmaster inner critic and is like, hey, what you doing? You're, you're, you're taking a rest, Oh, you're taking a you day. Oh, you turned off your phone. Oh, okay. So you think that you're you're gonna be a success by 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 taking a nap, by turning off your phone, by do not disturbing. That that's what you think. Okay, okay. Well, you're not, and you're gonna fail, and you better get back to work immediately. That's your taskmaster. Tell me, <laughs> for those of you who are listening to me, have you heard that mofo before? <laughs> I have. He's a very strong one inside my head, and he's definitely a dude. <laughs> a lot of my inner critics have lady voices and tendencies, but not that taskmaster. Nope, definitely a dude. <laughs> okay, so with the so then we have guilt tripper. 
The guilt tripper is the inner critic that likes you likes to make you feel guilty whenever it is that you go against something that you, your family, or your community has built up inside of you or around you as a value. Okay, so the guilt tripper is one of those ones that likes to keep you in your lane even if you've outgrown your lane. So let's say you have this lane They've been paving the road. They've been, you know, painting the lines on it. And they're like, this is your lane. And inside this lane, we have the values of X, Y, Z. And in order to stay in this lane, you have to be this person. You have to do these things. You have to accomplish these goals. And this is your lane. The other people in your life are in this lane. Stay in your lane. And then one day you go, I want to go over there. And I need a new lane to take me there. Well, the inner critic, the guilt tripper inner critic starts to make you feel guilty for wanting to exit that lane. And it starts saying, hey, but this is the lane that was created for us. These are the values inside of this lane that I'm supposed to follow. And yeah, okay, you don't know what's over there. Like the, over there could be very dangerous. <laughs> that could be a very scary place for you to be. And if you go over there, you're going to disappoint your mom and your dad and your siblings and you'll be all by yourself. And the guilt tripper inner critic likes to make you believe that you will lose all of the people in the lane that you're in if you decide to change lanes. Now, the messed up part about the guilt tripper inner critic is that it doesn't give you a way out of that guilt. There is no way to lose the guilt. You are just constantly being given the guilt and there's no way to alleviate that guilt. And that guilt keeps you in your lane. And you keep looking at wherever it is you wanna go with that tap, tap, tap on your heart and the tap, tap, tap on your head. And you just don't go because you're overwhelmed by guilt. So the sixth inner critic is the conformer, also known as the molder. Now, the conformer has a lot of similar characteristics to the guilt tripper, um, but they're not the same. OK, so the conformer is made from this box that is built around you as a mold from the people who helped you develop as a child. So whether that's your parents, your grandparents, anyone in your family, um, the teachers that you saw every day, your neighbors, your community members, um, any people that put you into a mold that could have been around any type of like su subject or ideology, right? You're in this mold. But at some point, some of you became a person that was like, okay, I get what's inside the box. I've been in the box. The box has molded me into this person. But when I peek over the edge of this box, I'm seeing a couple other things that I would like to explore. And then whoever helped you build your box comes by and slams the lid down and then goes, no, you're going to stay inside this box. You're going to conform to what you've been taught about who you should be and what you should do. And every time you peek over that box and maybe you get an arm out and then maybe you like put yourself up and your, your torso is out or you have one leg and one arm hanging off the edge, right? The conformer inner critic goes, nope, and flips your ass right back into the box. <laughs> Shuts the lid sometimes, right? And the problem with the conformer is, so there's, the conformer can be very confusing because sometimes, like the rest of the inner critics, the conformer likes to make you feel bad. Hey, you climbed over the edge of this box and we don't know what's outside of that box, but I'm fairly certain it'll hurt you and it's dangerous and don't go out there anymore, right? That's one side of the conformer inner critic. But the second side of the conformer inner critic is that it says, good job anytime you stay inside the box. If you stay inside the box, it goes good, good. That's exactly where we want you to be. See, don't you feel good inside this box? And so it praises you, which sends a message to your head that you're doing the right thing because you're receiving praise. You see that? You see how the conformer is a tricky, tricky inner critic? So then you stay inside because you're like, I'm doing a good thing, but then eventually, you hear the rumblings of, of music and parties and exploration outside of that box and you peek over again, <laughs> you wanna go out. And then your inner critic's like, no, and smacks your fingers off the edge of the box, right? Part of overcoming the um, conformer inner critic is learning when it's safe to go outside the box, right? 
Um, okay, and so the last inner critic is the destroyer. And I have a not so good feeling about destroyer inner critics because they are mean and they are ruthless and they are the inner critic that comes to destroy who you are on a very basic, fundamental, intrinsic level. It's the inner critic that comes in and is like, why are you even here? What is the point of you on the planet? Who do you think you are compared to all of these other magnificent people? And one of the examples that I like to use just to kind of give you a visualization of what this can look like with other people is I used to be in a group online with a bunch of different entrepreneurs and, and people who were ambitious and had projects that they wanted to see come to life with the intention of positively impacting their communities. There was a woman there who ran a nonprofit that was specifically for women who found themselves in situations that were harmful or abusive um, and that they wanted to get out of them. So she had resources up and down the state that could help. She started a fund so that if women didn't have money, that they could actually get some funds to start the, the journey to getting out of their um, their situations. They were constantly doing drives to collect items, like all of these things that were around her nonprofit. We all knew about it. And then one day she showed up to our group and she said, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy or anything like that. I'm not looking for you to like pat me on the head. But what I really need to know is if this is something that other people experience, especially women who are attempting to like big build projects. Sometimes I wake up and I just feel like a garbage person. I'm a garbage person. I am absolute trash. And there's a part of me that's like, but look at everything you do every day. Look at all the women that you've helped. God, I'm going to cry again. What is going on? <laughs> These stories are so real. Sometimes I get so touched in my heart and I don't know what it is about today. <laughs> it's not that time. <laughs> but I'm feeling very much in my heart and my feelings right now. Okay. <sighs> Look, at she's like, I know I look at all of the things that I do every day and the people that I've helped and and all of the aspirations that I have to make this something that's not just for my city or my state, but that is for my nation or it can even be global. She's like, I have all these aspirations and I know I'm helping people and yet I still cannot shake this feeling like I mean absolutely nothing and more than meaning nothing. I'm crap. I'm garbage. And I was like, oh, oh my God, how could you even possibly think that? And then I was like, oh, it's not her. That is the destroyer inner critic. Literally, no matter what it is you're doing, no matter who it is you're helping, no matter the positive impact you're creating, that destroyer inner critic comes in and is like, you ain't shit. And why are you even here anyways? It's the worst. <laughs> and it can be the hardest, the hardest one to overcome because it's attacking you on this intrinsic, why are you alive? Why do you do what you do? Um, why are you the person that you are? Because it's crap. Like that level is so deep and guttural. Like it hurts so much that that inner critic can literally stop you from doing what it is that you want to do. Now, inside of the Overpower Your Insecurity Guide, I do talk about the inner critics, but what I also talk about is why it is important to know all seven of these and then how it is that knowing all of them can help you overpower them. I took a lot of time talking about inner critics today, so I'm not going to go too, too deep into that, but it's inside of the Overpower Your Insecurities audio guide. So when you listen to that, you'll hear the rest of it. But I want you to understand one pivotal thing about inner critics before I move on to section three. And that is that a lot of the times we think about our inner critic as one inner critic, this one voice that's been developed, okay? And then when we understand that it's possible that our inner critic actually has these seven different voices that impact us with one loud, booming voice, when you learn what these seven are and which one of the seven, if not all of the seven, archetypes are within that one voice, you learn that you can pull the voices apart and then they become much more manageable because they're not so loud when they're all together, 
right? When they're all together, I want you to think about like, have you ever seen any movie where there's like a kid in the middle of a circle and there's like seven bullies like pointing like, ha ha ha, you know, you're dumb or whatever it is, right? Like you've seen, you've seen movies, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if that one kid was to take on all seven of those bullies at one time, how successful do you think he would be? But if it was just one, one on one, how successful do you think he would be? That's what's up, right? Okay, so section three of Overpower Your Insecurities audio guide is all of the goodness that can be created by overpowering your insecurities. There are four different points at the end that talk about this goodness. Um, one is you, your, you, <laughs> your needs and dreams are important. Um, so to like really stop treating them like they're not important because they are, and I help you develop the understanding as to why it is your needs and dreams are important. Um, learning self-acceptance as a superpower, the essential role of self-respect, and finding self-care that actually cares for yourself. So we're going to talk about self-care a little bit here today because it is very important for those of us who <clears throat> are ambitious people, which is all of you who are listening to me. Um, we know that perfectionism and um, perfectionism hits us really hard. The taskmaster inner critic hits us really hard. And we try to fight self-care because we believe that productivity and constantly being inside of our work is the only way that we can be successful. But I'm here to tell you that rest is essential to being successful because burnout don't get you nowhere but really far away from your goals trust me okay so the purpose of self-care is to care for yourself now i think that there's been a lot of misconception about self-care and that self-care is supposed to be a way for you to treat yourself which is like don't get me wrong i love to treat myself i, I absolutely believe that you should treat yourself but Treating yourself and doing things that care for yourself are two different things. Treating yourself can be part of your self-care, but your self-care doesn't always need to be treating yourself. So when we talk about self-care, if it's not something that's been on the docket or it's, you know, we're talking about taking rest, we're talking about learning to care for ourselves, when we don't know what to do, where do we turn? Google, Google tells us everything that's a bad idea. <laughs> I know that Google has a lot of answers, but it does not have all the answers. I'm going to ask you to do something different. Instead of immediately turning to Google to figure out what your self-care should be, turn to yourself first. What are some of the reasons that people don't ask themselves about self-care first, right? So let's go back when I was talking in the beginning of this episode about how when you were a kid, during your development, people are always telling you what to do. So when you're trying to figure out what it is you should do for your self-care, you're like, I don't know, it's like someone told me I should do self-care to begin with, so someone else should tell me what to do for my self-care, <laughs> right? And that's a fair point, actually. <laughs> when I said it out loud, I was like, that's actually a fair point. Someone told you to do self-care, so then you're like, okay, but can you also tell me what to do? <laughs> but in actuality, your self-care is personalized to who you are in the same way that your self-confidence is personalized to who you are, right? What makes me feel confident may not make you feel confident at all. What, me, what makes me feel cared for may not make you feel cared for at all. I always go back to that example of mani pedis. People are always like, oh, I love getting mani pedis. I love it. It's like, if it's such, such good self-care. And I'm like, absolutely not. I do not. <laughs> I do not feel cared for when other people groom me. I like to be groomed. Like, I like, like, I like sitting and like picking out new nail polish and like, you know, doing my nails and being like, oh, 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 like my nail, they so cute, right? But like having someone else do that for me isn't as fulfilling. I don't feel cared for, but I do feel cared for when I do it on myself, right? So when we ask ourselves, what makes me feel cared for, then we can engage those things. And when we, we are looking externally for answers to self-care, this is where we get people who believe that like the self-care is a myth, 
right? It doesn't actually do anything. And it's like, well, that's because you're doing self-care that was for somebody else's care. It was a suggestion that somebody gave you because it makes them feel cared for. So if it didn't do the same thing for you, that's fine. It doesn't mean that self-care isn't real or doesn't work. It just means that we need to figure out what your self-care activities are and how to make them a part of your life. So I talk in depth about this entire process in episode 24 of Women of Color and Confidence. It's titled, The Essential Self-Care Practices for Maintaining Your Self-Confidence. But here today, I'm going to make this long story very, very, very short so that you get the idea. But if you want specifically how to do this whole process, go listen to episode 24. First, we start by asking ourselves, hey, self. Hey, Amber Rose. Now you say it. Okay, perfect. (laughs) What makes me feel cared for? How do I feel cared for? Some of the things that make me feel cared for is having enough drinkable water in the house. (laughs) It's for real though. When I'm out of water in the house, I'm like, I had Why didn't I take care of myself (laughs) by getting more water to put in my house? Other things are getting enough sleep. Other things are having fresh flowers around, Um, cooking myself meals, doing activities or hobbies that make me feel happy, things that I can do with my hands. I like crocheting. I like embroidery, right? Reading a book, writing. Oh my gosh, whenever I make time to write, I'm like, now that's how we take care of ourselves. Yes, I feel so pumped when I make that time, right? So it isn't about Googling suggestions. It's about sitting down for your, down with yourself and saying, what makes me feel cared for? And then incorporating those things into your life, okay? Remember I said this is very, very long story, very short, okay? So I'm not gonna tell you how to incorporate those things into your life. But what I can say is that I understand that we've gotten to this point where we believe that self-care practices are mostly expensive or time consuming, okay? And some of them may be. And there's a time and a place for those self-care practices that are expensive and time consuming. But our self-care practices range from, I want to think you to think of it on a scale. So at one end, we have those activities that are very little to maybe even no, little to no money, time, and effort. And then you travel all the way to the other side of the spectrum, where at the other end, you have self-care activities that take a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort, okay? It's this big sliding scale. And you have self-care activities that fit on every level of that scale. So first we need to figure out what your all of your your self-care activities are that make you feel really good, okay? One of my like no money, no time, no effort self-care activities is journaling for at least 10 minutes every morning, drinking either my pre-workout before a workout or drinking my tea. That's it. That's what I do. 10 minutes a day, self-care done, right? On the other end of it, some of my self-care activities are like a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort are like traveling, you know, girls trips, birthday trips, cruises, but I haven't been on a cruise. I want to go on a cruise. That's why I said that. I'm excited. (laughs) But it takes time and it takes money and it takes effort to go on a big trip like that, right? But then in between, I have self-care activities that some of them are on the lower end, some of them are on the higher end, and some of them are in the middle, right? Um... Being able to take time to sit down and write takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of time, no money, right? Uh, Making a date to meet my friend at the beach so that we can go swimming together. Some time, some effort, a little bit of money, pay for gas maybe, maybe buy some snacks, okay, right? Maybe I want to go do a class in the city, right? It's going to take some money. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort, but like it's not something that I have to do every day. I can do it once a week or once a month, right? So there are all of these things that can be included in your self-care that are on this scale. And what you have to figure out first is what they are, and then you put them in the appropriate places of your life and your schedule, right? And spoiler alert, self-care is a daily habit. 
But the reason that you're not doing it every day is one, you haven't found self-care that actually cares for yourself. And two, all of it, the self-care activities that you're looking at are on the more expensive, more time-consuming side of the scale rather than the sliding scale that's in the middle. Okay, so this self-care that cares for yourself is actually point number 13 in the Overcome Your Insecurities audio guide. I go into much more detail about how to create that list and then how to like put it into your life um, and then how to implement all of those self-care activities um, that are on your list into the appropriate places into your life and into the schedule. So I want to wrap this up by sharing with all of you the 14 points that are included in the guide because there's something for everyone in here. Today I only covered in a little bit more depth those three, um, but there, there are 14 inside the guide and I truly believe that they're all essential to starting or continuing um, the confidence building journey. So here's what I'll be sharing and how you can benefit from this audio guide. This is the 14 points inside the guide. Number one, inner knowing fuels everything. Number two, honesty as a like life hack. Number three, neutralize negativity. Number four, close the door on comparison. Number five, self, self-talk, <laughs> self-talk. <laughs> Number five, self-talk with a smile. Number six, put perfectionism in its place. Number seven, meet the inner critics. Number eight, outsmart imposter syndrome. Number nine, break free from the judgment cycle. Number 10, cure comparison in one step. Number 11, self-acceptance is your superpower. Number 12, your needs and dreams are important. Number 13, self-care that cares for yourself. And number 14, the essential role of self-respect. The link to download this audio guide is in the show notes of this episode. You can also visit www.vibrantconfidence.com slash overpower14, and that's the number 1414, and start listening to it right now. You could literally go listen to it right now. It's ready for you. <laughs> Each point in the audio guide is short enough for you to listen to over a cup of coffee, but is packed with information to benefit you on this amazing journey to overpowering your insecurities and developing more vibrant confidence. Don't worry, there is no workbook, there's no homework, it's literally just the audio guide. I wanted you to feel like you could easily begin building your self-confidence with all the paperwork. You don't need extra paperwork in your life. Just come, listen up, see how it is that you feel as you're listening to each point, and see how it is that you can implement each point into your life. It was an absolute joy and pleasure putting together this audio guide. So I hope that you enjoy it and I hope that you feel all the motivation and support that I infused into each and every point. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this week's episode of Women of Color and Confidence. I'll be back with y'all in two weeks with a fresh new episode. Ta-ta for now.